An extremely significant concept is that of frequency response. In this video, we're going to look at frequency response in the context of finite impulse response systems. Recall that a system or a filter expresses the output as a function of the input. Our objectives are to define the frequency response of a system and specifically to look at the frequency response for FIR filters. Now the frequency response is obtained from the response of a system to a complex sinusoid. Now frequency response is most useful for linear time invariant systems. And in that case, we can write the output y of n as this weighted sum of the input. But in the case of an FIR filter, it simply is taking the m plus 1 current and past values of the input and adding them up with weights h of k. So to find the frequency response, we're going to assume that the input is a complex sinusoid with frequency f hat. We'll substitute this definition for x of n into our expression for the system output, and we obtain that y of n is the sum from k equals 0 to m hk e to the j 2 pi f hat times the quantity n minus k. We can factor out the e to the j 2 pi f hat n term from this sum because it doesn't depend on k, and we see that y of n is e to the j 2 pi f hat n times this sum from k equals 0 to m hk e to the minus j 2 pi f hat k. Recall this sum h of f hat, and this is the frequency response of this system. It's very important to observe that we put in a complex sinusoid of frequency f hat. What came out of the system was also a complex sinusoid with frequency f hat. And this is true of any linear time invariant system. If you put in a complex sinusoid of a given frequency, you will get out a complex sinusoid of the same frequency, and only the amplitude and phase can be changed by the system. Complex sinusoid in results in a complex sinusoid out, and the input is multiplied by the frequency response h of f hat. Now let's suppose we put in an input consisting of a sum of two complex sinusoids, one at frequency f1 hat, we'll put a weight a in front of that one, and then another at frequency f2 hat with weight b. The fact that the system is linear means that the output is the weighted sum of the outputs due to the individual complex sinusoids. So e to the j 2 pi f1 hat n produces output h of f1 hat e to the j 2 pi f1 hat n, while e to the j 2 pi f2 hat n would produce output h of f2 hat e to the j 2 pi f2 hat n. And by linearity, the output is the same weighted sum as the input. So we end up with a times this quantity plus b times the output due to f2 hat. You can do this for an arbitrary number of complex sinusoids using linearity. That is, if I express my input as a weighted sum of complex sinusoids, then the output is a weighted sum of the same complex sinusoids, but the frequency response of the system modifies the weights. This is one of the reasons that Fourier methods are so powerful. Suppose that the output y of n is one half of x of n plus one half x of n minus one. That is, y of n is the average of the two most recent inputs. And what would the frequency response be for such a system? We apply an input consisting of a complex sinusoid at frequency f hat. And that gives us an output, y of n being 1 half e to the j 2 pi f hat n plus 1 half e to the j 2 pi f hat times the quantity n minus 1. We can factor out the terms that are independent of n, and that leaves us with the complex sinusoid times 1 half plus 1 half e to the minus j 2 pi f hat. So we see that the frequency response is this term that's multiplying the complex sinusoid. Recall that if we put a complex sinusoid in, we get the same complex sinusoid out multiplied by the frequency response. We can get some insight 
in this case of an averaging system as to what this frequency response looks like. We're going to use a simple trick to simplify this expression. We're going to factor out half of this exponent from both terms. e to the minus j pi f hat is half of the exponent. And if I pull that out of both terms, then to keep the expression the same, I need to have 1 half e to the j pi f hat plus 1 half e to the minus j pi f hat. The benefit of writing it this way is we can immediately recognize that h of f hat is e to the minus j pi f hat times cosine of pi f hat. So this is a complex number. We can write it in polar form as the magnitude of h of f hat times e to the j angle h of f hat. The magnitude of h of f hat is the magnitude of the cosine. And since the discrete time frequency is only considered on the interval from minus a half to one half, the cosine is always positive. So the magnitude of the cosine is exactly equal to the cosine. And our frequency response magnitude takes this half of a cosine shape. There's a peak at one and it goes to zero at plus one half and at minus one half because at plus or minus one half, we have cosine of pi over two. So the angle of h of f hat is negative pi f hat, and that's a straight line with slope negative pi. So it starts at negative one half cycles per sample at pi over two, and then it's gonna decrease through zero at f hat equals zero, and be minus pi over two at f hat equals one half. Well, since the output is the frequency response times a complex sinusoid, if we write this frequency response in polar form, we can write the output as the magnitude of h of f hat times e to the j 2 pi f hat n plus the phase of h of f hat. So we see that this system introduces a frequency dependent gain, h of f hat, and also a frequency dependent phase shift. Now the frequency dependent gain gives us a fairly intuitive characterization of the system. If the frequency of the input is close to zero, in other words, we have a fairly low frequency sinusoid as an input, then the gain that the system applies to that sinusoid is near one. In other words, the system is gonna pass that sinusoid without a significant decrease in amplitude. On the other hand, if the frequency of that sinusoid is close to one half, the system has a very low gain to that sinusoid because the gain here is small, it's close to zero, and therefore the system tends to attenuate or stop high frequency sinusoids. And this agrees with our intuition. When we do an average, we tend to smooth out signals. So if the signal is smooth to begin with, that is, it has a very low frequency, then we're not going to change the signal much. But if the signal varies rapidly, in other words, has mostly high frequency content, the smoothing process is gonna average those fluctuations out and we're gonna be left with a much smaller amplitude signal. Another example where y of n is 1 half x of n minus 1 half x of n minus one. So this system takes the difference of the two most recent inputs and divides that by two. Again, we'll put an input equal to a complex sinusoid with frequency f hat, then the output is 1 half e to the j 2 pi f hat n minus 1 half e to the j 2 pi f hat quantity n minus 1. We can factor out the term that depends on n from both of these, and we end up with the quantity 1 half minus 1 half e to the minus j 2 pi f hat times e to the j 2 pi f hat n. We can ask how this system behaves and what the frequency response looks like. We'll do a similar trick that we did a minute ago in that we're gonna factor out one half of this exponent from both of these terms. And that'll give us e to the minus j pi f hat, and then we'll have an e to the j pi f hat in the first term with the one half, and then the minus one half will have e to the minus j pi f hat. In order to get an answer, that is familiar, we're going to put a j in the denominator of both of these terms, and we'll pull that j out in front as well. So if you multiply this factor out in front, 
times these terms, you see that we'll get exactly back to h of f hat. So we haven't changed the expression, we've only changed the way it's written. And in this form, we can see that h of f hat can be expressed as sine of pi f hat times e to the j pi over 2, j is e to the j pi over 2, minus pi f hat. In this case, the magnitude of h of f hat is the magnitude of sine of pi f hat. So we can graph the magnitude of sine pi f hat for frequencies between minus one half and one half cycles per sample, and we see that it's zero near f e hat equals zero because the sine is zero at zero, and then near one half and minus one half, the magnitude becomes one because sine of pi over 2 and sine of minus pi over 2 are plus and minus 1. We're taking the magnitudes. They're both positive. Again, the output, if we write the frequency response in polar form, then the output can be expressed as y of n being the magnitude of h of f e to the j 2 pi f hat n plus the phase of h of f hat. h of f hat magnitude gives a frequency dependent gain to the input sinusoid and that gain varies depending on whether the frequency is small or large. In this case when the frequency is close to zero, in other words the frequency is low, the system attenuates the input sinusoid. While if the frequency is fairly high, that is close to one half or minus one half, the system gives unit gain to that sinusoid. And so essentially it's going to pass that sinusoid. And this is intuitively reasonable since we know that if we take a difference and the signal is not changing much between samples, in other words, it's nearly constant, then this difference is going to be close to zero. And that's the case we have when we have the low frequency. On the other hand, if x of n were to alternate sign between samples, which would do if it corresponded to frequency one half, then when I take this difference, I'm going to have a gain of 1. So that signal is going to be passed. Now the approach we just took in these two examples generalizes to an arbitrary FIR filter. It can be written as h of 0 times x of n plus h of 1 x of n minus 1 plus the pattern continues until we get to h of m x of a n minus m. To find the frequency response of this system we're going to put a complex sinusoid into the system and the frequency will be f hat. In that case, you can do the algebra and you find that the output y of n can be written as h of f hat times e to the j 2 pi f hat n. In other words, the output is the product of the input and the frequency response. And the frequency response h of f hat is simply given by h of 0 plus h of 1 times e to the minus j 2 pi f hat plus etc up to h of m e to the minus j 2 pi f hat times m. So in the previous two examples we had capital M equals 1. So let's take an example where we actually go the other direction. Given the frequency response we find the impulse response. So suppose h of f hat is 1 plus 2 times e to the minus j 2 f hat minus 4 times e to the minus j 2 pi f hat times 5 and our goal is to find the impulse response h of k. Well, the way we can approach this problem is to note that we have an expression for h of f hat that is basically the same form as our general expression for h of f hat, where the impulse response is the coefficients in front of the various powers of e to the j 2 pi f hat. So if I look at the system that I'm interested in, I see that I have the highest power of e to the j 2 pi f hat is 5. Therefore, capital M has to be equal to 5. And I can do a term-by-term -term comparison here. The 1 is associated with e to the j 2 pi f hat times 0, or constant term. And therefore, h of 0 has to be 1. The 2 is in front of e to the minus j 2 pi f hat. And therefore, 2 has to correspond to h of 1. And then I don't have any terms with e to the j 2 pi f hat times 2 or 3 or 4. Those coefficients have to be 0. And finally, my last term, 
was associated with m equals 5, and therefore h of 5 is what's multiplying e to the minus j 2 pi f hat times 5, and that is minus 4. So h of 5 is equal to minus 4. The frequency response is a very, very powerful concept 